Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. We've got a cool guest today introduced to me by another friend and somebody you've seen on the show a couple times, Mr. Fred Burton. And today we've got Mark Zaid. You are a attorney, super attorney, according to what I read online. You're a Washington, D.C. area-based attorney that specializes in specializes in protecting people from our government and representing them against the government, right? Uh, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, that designation allows you to wear certain clothing under your main <laughs> attire, uh, you gotta, you gotta which I can't for- show. I can't, I'm not allowed to reveal it, but it's you get a certification and a certificate to, to wear like underoos and, and stuff. Underoos. That's... Y- did you ever read that uh, or hear about that judge that got caught doing weird shit under his robe? Did you ever <laughs> hear about him? I'll tell you about uh, him uh, offline. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I know the specific one, and I, I have a feeling it's probably happened to more than one judge. Uh, I, I just d- thought about it when you said underoos. I just thought, yeah. I just imagined you in underoos right now during this discussion. <laughs> That's a terrible image. It is I terrible. I, I didn't wear those when I when I was a kid, even uh, sitting on but, a yoga ball below camera yeah. angle in Spider-Man underoos. Yeah. Oh, the conversation has already devolved. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Fred Burton, Fred is a super solid individual with a super cool background. How did you two guys get together? So Fred and I met a n- number of years ago. I'm trying to actually remember. I, I got to that age where I forget more than I remember nowadays. Uh, but I, I believe I was helping Fred as I do with a number of people on pre-publication review. So anyone who has held a security clearance with the U.S. government is going to be familiar with the restrictions, obviously, on them, that they're not allowed to disclose classified information without authorization. And those who held certain levels of clearances, uh, such as uh, top secret, secret compartmented information, otherwise known as TSSCI, they have a mandatory pre-publication review requirement for the entirety of their lives in perpetuity, which means they need to submit their manuscript or their op-ed or their speech, whatever it might be, their resume uh, to the government, to the agency that last held their clearance uh, to determine if there's any classified information in the contents. Um, Now, I actually, I recommend that for anyone who's ever had a clearance to do even if you had a secret level clearance, because you'd rather find out before you published it that it's classified yeah, than after. Uh, But it's not required. Uh, So those that are required not only have this uh, obligation to avoid being criminally prosecuted for leaking classified info, but they also face potential civil lawsuits for breach of contract Mm. if they don't follow the instructions of the government with respect to the information. That even means if it's unclassified. If someone who has uh, who had TSSEI access uh, and writes a book and didn't submit it at all, and it turns out there's not even one word of classified info, but they didn't submit it, they could actually be sued for breach of contract and lose millions of dollars, you know, if that was actually just at play. A procedural violation, they just didn't follow the right. rules. Now, I stuff think, like that never happens in that extreme, but it, it could. It could. It could. Somebody could go after a, a person for it is what you're saying. Yeah. So I'm I'm representing uh, individuals like right now, uh, the former secretary of defense, Mark Esper, is a client and we're litigating against the Department of Defense for his forthcoming book, which will be out in May of 2022 of this year. Uh, and. The government had been withholding 80 or so pages and we sued and now I've got it down to like, I don't know, less than two pages. That's great. I did. I think you also helped my friend Jack Carr, if memory serves. Don't think so. I I, I, I Uh, thought that that was what (laughs) Fred Fred had brought up because he's written, now I think he's on his book four or five. Yeah. Well, not in litigation, at least not in litigation. I I know who you're talking about. I think it was just some type of of uh, offline stuff. But yeah, um, I think that it might have just been discussions. And I mean, sometimes I just guide I provide guidance to folks, you know, who call up 
uh, or, or, or put in contact with me um, rather than litigation. But I, I have litigated more of these cases than anyone in history. I can, I can honestly say that. What, uh, what attracted you to that? You know, some lawyers that you read like a Grisham novel and everybody wants to be the guy that's putting the murderer in jail or getting the, the good guy free. This is such a, uh, I don't want to say fringe, but such a something so far away from what you think of when you think of most attorneys. Yeah, it's an, it's a niche, I guess would yeah. be better than a fridge. Um, and it, it's I love the niche. I mean, I've been doing it for now almost 30 years and uh, dealing with national security cases. I, I am never bored with with what I handle. And, you know, I get asked the question, of course, kind of like, you know, how'd you get in? You know, I had, I had no family members who were lawyers. I don't remember any friends, parents who were lawyers who, you know, kind of led me down, pulled me aside and talked to me about it. I, so the, the only thing I could ever say as far as like, how did I at least first like get into law? Because I remember having an interest in going to law school. I was going to be either a marine biologist and study sharks. Ooh. And I literally went to marine biology summer camp for two years in the Florida Keys, catching and tagging sharks. Oh, that's cool uh, memories. And it was awesome. Uh, at, or, or go to law school. And uh, I went to law school instead, which was the right decision because I have <laughs> developed some inner ear ob uh, problems that I can't be on the water for long periods of oh, time no. or, or I get very dizzy. So uh, that was a good choice because that would have been a problem. Uh, but I, I think just I, I was a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln and, and I mm -hmm. have childhood memories recalling reading about him teaching himself law you know, at the light of a fire when he was a kid, just kind of lying there working, in his locked working cabin as a clerk. Yeah. Yep. And just just reading and teaching himself. Uh, I, I think that more than anything might have influenced me. But I had a, a fascination with the Kennedy assassination, JFK's assassination, the president's. And I spent a lot of I, I still work on some issues that we can talk about because uh, I helped get the documents released even today. But I had this real interest in the in the 70s, 80s and into the early 90s or all pre law, pre law school into the late 80s. And there was I was really fascinated by the intelligence side of it. O Oswald, I guess, is the only one of two ex Marines rather than a former Marine. Him, him and John Murtha, I'm told, are the only ex Marines. There maybe maybe there's somebody else by now. now um, I got to interrupt here because I've gotten bit by this. A Marine is always a Marine. That's they, why I say ex -marine. They don't even say former. They don't even say former. Oh, they don't even say former. Okay, no. I, can, I get that. But I'm trying to make the distinction. I remember a douche, so he's an ex-Marine. I remember I being it. told the distinction between the former and the ex. Got it. You know, uh, so if there's even, I'm not even supposed to go to the fort. It's supposed to be you're a Marine or you're an ex-Marine. Yeah. And that ex-Marine category uh, would just be John Murtha, who I sued, which we can talk about because of Haditha. Uh, war crimes with Iraq when I was representing uh, one of the Marines who was accused of war crimes by him, uh, who ultimately who did it, I think, commit war crimes uh, and and Lee Harvey Oswald. Anyway, Os uh, the, the, the military angle fascinated me. The intelligence side fascinated me. Uh, and, and I always wanted to go into the U.S. government. Actually, I wanted to work either at the CIA, the FBI, um, in intelligence and in law enforcement, maybe military. And, you know, you make efforts and certain things don't work out. I couldn't become an FBI agent because my vision was so poor. Uh, it wasn't correct. It couldn't be corrected to a level that would allow for the, at least back 30 years ago to be an agent. Maybe, maybe now I could, um, no, except too old now. Um, the CIA, I didn't, I didn't have, you can only get into CIA as a lawyer through an honors program at the time, at least, and I didn't have the grades to get in. I, I applied to be in the Navy JAG, actually, in law school, uh, but the economy was so bad when I was in school that they actually got overwhelmed and inundated by applications from Ivy League law schools, mm. and the competition level went up so much that if, if it had been like five years earlier, I probably would have been in. I would have had an entirely different career. We probably wouldn't be talking now, but I got denied uh, entry into the Navy. So 
Instead, I decided that because I couldn't get into the government where I wanted to be, that I was just going to be a pain in the ass and sue them all the time okay. and have fun with that. And after a few years, they would, in order to get rid of me, they would bring me into the government and hire me. And that was actually the plan for a bunch of years. And it almost worked. <laughs> it almost worked. Uh, I had a few possibilities, but ultimately it didn't. And I just have had too much fun being on the outside and now they can't afford me. I was about to say, so then you, you also would have foregone lawyer pay for federal employee pay. And that's not, not anything that you want to do. It's not close, but for the first 10 or so years of law practice, the law, the, the government lawyer pay would have been better. Probably uh, my first, one of my first big cases was to sue the government of Libya for the bombing oh, yes, of I've read about this bombing of Pan Am flight 103 Lockerbie Scotland yep December 21st 1988 uh which I vividly remember that day uh when when the news hit I had been in I studied in England work studied in, and worked in England London the semester before so I was there in the spring of 88 as part of a college program and this was this impacted the students that were there on the fall of 88 program. And there were two of my uh, schoolmates were on board. Uh, somebody from my hometown mm -hmm. was on board uh, from the New York City area where most of the passengers were, were going to. Uh, and so it was very meaningful and personal to me. And I embarked on throughout law school going after whoever was responsible, uh, which we didn't know was Libya until the end of 1991. Uh, so I filed the first lawsuit against Libya in September and then D September 93 in Scotland and then December 93 in D.C. And we settled the case 10 years later and we got two point seven billion dollars for the families, 10 million for each victim, uh, which uh, would one would think would mean I'm filthy rich. But unfortunately, there were way too many lawyers involved. But it did it did get me better pay at that who, point in time than the who federal government tells a foreign government to actually pay. You know, this was an incredibly unique situation. I, I Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, to his credit, participated in the lawsuit. He didn't have to. I, I mean, technically, he had to in the sense I, I properly served the government. Uh, I, I actually sent them return receipt mail which i got the you know the pink card wow you know that's green here in the united states domestic but it's pink when you send it overseas i actually got one back that i sent to libya for serving them but um most of the countries that are sued on when there's foreign sovereign immunity there's a whole process you have to go there's only a certain type of case you can bring against a foreign government here in the united states most of the times the countries never show up. Iran never shows up. Iraq at the day didn't show up. Even Russia at times would just say, nah, screw you. And you'd get a default judgment. And most of the time you can't enforce it because there's, there's tons of problems with enforcing a default judgment and finding assets of a foreign government here in the United States that's not considered diplomatic, which you can't seize. Mm. Uh, so a lot of times it's just a symbolic victory for the victims so we, we had to we had to redraft legislation which i did i took the lead on it to allow lawsuits against libya and other terrorist states cuba at the time although i think back again uh i think the trump administration might have put them back on the list but at the time we had seven countries on the list there's only three or so now uh like north korea and sudan uh iran it was a Iraq at the time. Syria was on at one time, may, may still be. Um, and that would strip them of sovereign immunity. So Libya thought, and correctly, actually, in the in the long term, thought that this would be a good way to reestablish relations with the United States, maybe even to also deny that it did it. Because even though we settled, just like any civil case, you know, there was no admission of liability. There was just, OK, we're going to pay. Uh, for the sake of whatever. And they were under sanctions, UN and US, United Nations and US sanctions. They wanted out of them. 
And as part of the deal, uh, the way the settlement was negotiated by lawyers other than me, I mean, by this time, there were a lot of other lawyers. When we first started the case in 93, it was literally three of us. And by the end, there were unfortunately a lot. And that meant there was a committee that controlled how the case went. And they lawyers being lawyers. Uh, I, I, we got along worse with our American lawyer counterparts than we did the lawyers representing the Libyans, including the foreign lawyers, uh, which is sad to say. Um, but they imposed a bunch of conditions. So like they got four million dollars when when the U.N. sanctions were lifted, which was going to be a guarantee. Uh, so that got paid out relatively early. But then the next four million wouldn't be paid until the U.S. sanctions were going to be lifted in. And we didn't expect that at all. And, and the families didn't want to be lobbyists to lobby to help Libya because mm -hmm. they still believe Libya to this day murdered their loved ones. Yeah. Why why some of my colleagues allowed that to be in um, really still pisses me off. That's quite despicable. frankly. But the Bush administration on its own, um, uh, basically because Gaddafi was an enemy of, of Al Qaeda as well. He was not a religious leader. He, he was secular. And, and so they hated him as much as they hated us. Uh, so Gaddafi was helping the United States behind the scenes in the mid 2000s or, or early to mid 2000s. So Bush administration struck a deal. U.S. sanctions got lifted, surprisingly. Uh, and then he uh, Gaddafi had to be taken off the terrorist list, uh, which, again, we weren't going to lobby to do. Uh, and on its own, after a few years, I believe in 2008, uh, give or take, uh, the Bush administration pulled him off of the terrorist list. So that was the next, the final $2 million. So, I mean, it, it was a good deal for Libya because once all the sanctions were pulled off, all of the oil and gas companies from around the world, especially France, went right back in to Libya, which was very, is a very oil rich and gas rich country. Hmm. So it, it was a good strategic decision, economic decision for Libya. Um, obviously at the end of the day, it didn't work out well for Gaddafi, not relation to this, but you know, he was, he was overthrown mm -hmm. in 20, I keep forgetting 2011, 2012 and, and killed as part of that. And then of course we had Benghazi in, in 2012, which I represented uh, most of the, the CIA folks uh, who were defending the the CIA base there. Well, not most, but the, all, if anyone who's listening has seen uh, the movie 13 Hours or read the book, I handled the pre-publication review of that book uh, and that film uh, and the story of, of several of the CIA officer, uh, CIA gun handlers, so to speak the security mm -hmm. that defended everyone's lives and saved everyone's lives other than the ambassador and a couple and uh, three of the others who were killed, uh, unfortunately, sadly. The government probably did not want a lot of that story put into books and movies. No, it was um, it was a battle for sure with the CIA. And uh, ultimately, it was a successful one and it was a great story. I mean, the CIA, everyone really looked good for what they did. I mean, there was so much heroism. I mean, obviously the story, the, what's on the film is theatrical. Um, I mean, just like Black Hawk Down, it's not, it's based on true stories, but it's not the true story. Uh, in 13 hours, there was a hell of a lot of more explosions in the film that happened in the real fighting. Uh, but it was life and death fighting. and bullets flying and people died uh, and were seriously injured. And these guys were heroes. And so it was a great story to be told. And there are people being prosecuted. So the government needed these guys as witnesses. Also, in the criminal trial, there's still one pending trial, as I recall, of someone uh, here in D.C. Okay. Uh, I forget from where uh, I don't remember if it was Libyan or not. But I mean, there were hundreds of people who perpetrated the the act. Um, I'd like to see more people prosecuted, but obviously these people are not here in the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what is it about uh, your job 
being on the side of the people against government that so attracted you? Yeah, it's it's a kind of David and Goliath type attitude that I have, uh, I think uh, is the best way to describe it. I, I really do like fighting for the underdog. underdog. Um, I like taking on the giants and, and bringing them down uh, and showing that you can't be pushed around. I hate bullies. I think, I, I mean, I honestly do think in some part it was because I was bullied when I was a kid. Um, I, I was really small uh, height wise until like 10th or 11th grade. I mean, now I'm five, five, 10. So, uh, I mean, I became a little bit more than average height, but until literally 11th grade, I would, I was probably the, if not the smallest boy, the second or third smallest boy. And, you know, even shorter than a lot of the girls. Uh, and that meant you got picked on. Now, fortunately, I was one of the fastest in the grade also for running track. Uh, and, and I, and I fought back. I mean, I would take on four or five guys at a time who would be just real bullies, uh, and end up in the principal's office quite a lot. Uh, and you know, you know, it's pretty true in most cases where you take on the bully, you know, it turns out that they're, I don't know if they're more scared than you are, but they, they're, they're not much of a bully when you punch them in the face, mm -hmm. uh, afterwards. And that, that really did impact me, uh, a lot. And, and I do not like the, the government pushing people around. Now I don't have a problem with flexing and exercise of power. And, you know, if this is what the rule is and people aren't following the rule, then, Hey, you know, the government can go after them. But if, if the government's going after someone improperly, uh, in excess, that that really bothers me uh you know someone the government an agency taking away someone's security clearance unfairly uh i i'm really stoked in fighting for folks uh to to make sure that they are treated fairly and equitably and consistently hmm. it's interesting how much that happens when we have so much of the government run by lawyers they should know the law they should know the constitution yeah, uh, you know, there is there you you see there's a real groupthink mentality and I think anyone who served in law enforcement or military or government something in an organized fashion, you know, will probably have seen some example of it where it becomes a lot easier just to go along and it becomes more difficult to be the one to stand up and say, you know, hang on a second, the king doesn't have any clothes on. And a lot of time I see this in my intelligence cases all the time when when someone is facing a problem, some sort of disciplinary issue, clearance issue, whatever it might be, especially when they're in a covert world. And the government, it, it, when someone has an issue, you know, it's not supposed to be shared with other people. There's there are laws to protect the privacy of that individual federal employee. So oftentimes people around you don't know what the issue is. They just know you're in trouble, mm -hmm. uh, but in trouble in the sense of not like, oh, I got to go help you trouble. It's, oh no, Joe is having some issues. He's accused of something. You know what? I don't want to go near him because I don't want to get caught up in it too. Yeah, and it becomes I don't, I don't very stink on me. Self -pres preservation. And you really learn who your friends are when you're in trouble inside the federal government and deeper inside uh the intelligence community and also the military uh i would say as well and law enforcement because every there's this guilt by association and so you're walking down the hallway and you see your who was your friend you thought down the way and all of a sudden they veer off into a you know a room even though they saw you uh and and the conspiracy starts going, the paranoia starts working its way, even in even in my spies who are trained to deal with these issues, because all of a sudden they start thinking very often that, oh, man, everybody is against me now. And mm -hmm. it, it often usually isn't. I, I came up with a, a, a thing years ago where I talk about the conspiracy of one, which by law, there's no such thing. A conspiracy is two or more people conspiring to to act together. But the conspiracy of one is the notion that you feel that everyone is against you, but 
and and sometimes they are. Uh, that does happen where folks conspire together. But it's oftentimes that they're just turning the other way because they don't want to they don't want to get involved with the stink that they think is surrounding you, and mm -hmm. they don't have the guts and the courage to help you out and and stand up and that's really unfortunate and oftentimes i'm the only one who ends up fighting for the person because and that who knows what's going on uh and because the folks around them are all hightailing it elsewhere so they don't get in trouble now that's not always i mean i i have i have dealt with some amazing people over the years who and the clients very often are amazing but they're friends who come to help them and and say to hell with it I don't care what the risk is to myself. This is wrong. What whatever agency's involved uh, is is doing something, and and I'm going to, you know, if need be, sacrifice myself. Which which I will say, I, I literally have never seen happen. I always tell people, I have never seen an agency retaliate against someone for helping someone else. Hmm. Which is the the real moral of the story to share to everybody because it's like, please come forward and help your colleague and friend. And nothing really will the, usually like happen core of what you're known for is defending whistleblowers right yeah I, there's a I, I i do a lot of whistleblower work um they're difficult cases uh, and i would say the most cases i do are security clearances federal employment issues okay. um a lot of representation of journalists for foia a lot of military cases um but whistleblowers are a large part. And usually when I'm doing them, they're national security related and we tend to make them high profile. They become high profile because that often helps in, in those cases <clears throat> to be able to make them to gain a lot of attention, to put pressure on the U S government. I mean, you know, when I talk about like kind of this David and Goliath type situation, uh, and, or let's say Samson. Uh, to kind of reverse it a little bit, right? Uh, not Sam, or I'm trying to get my biblical figures. I, I'm going to screw the names up, so I'll just talk about the the notion of it. The notion of this kind of all powerful being that only has, you know, very uh, uh, small weaknesses. But that the, was but Samson. There, that was that, that's that Samson. Was Samson. Is that Samson. Is that the yeah. with the, his Achilles' heel? Is Samson Delilah right? Cut off Delilah or the hair? Cut off his hair. Who's the yeah. one with the with the heel with the heel? You're it's mixing the mythology, I'm getting mythology and, and religion. And, yeah, okay. and in in Christianity, <laughs> Judaism. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm just trying to come up with these we'll ones just, where just there's stick there's, to, we'll there's stick to the law. We'll okay. Stick. There's a weakness, <laughs> and and the so the federal government is really weak and vulnerable at dealing with the media and hmm. dealing with high profile it you can put pressure on the federal government it doesn't deal with it very well when i can get a case into the press when i can get a case taken up by members of congress the, it doesn't always work it's not a guaranteed success but it is a generally depending on the facts of the case obviously a very strategic decision to be able to do uh, so when we did the Haditha case uh, back 15 years ago already, it was uh, a situation in Iraq in November of 2005, if I have my dates correct. Um, and, oh, something like 26, 24, 26 Iraqi civilians were, were killed. And I'd say of those, honestly, maybe about three of them were were suspect as far as mm. being bad guys the vast majority of the people that were killed were innocent civilians i mean there's just no doubt about it uh doesn't doesn't mean that they weren't legal kills um because of the way the 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 rules of law work and how uh the the the, the laws of war work um but some of those individuals killed were absolutely murdered there's no doubt about it. Uh, and it was it became, as it should have been, a, a really high profile, big stink because uh, it was going to be one of the first early war crimes cases coming out of Iraq. And uh, we were representing the squad leader uh, who I, I believe still to this day was not one of the people responsible for the war crimes, but they pinned it all on at first all on this guy. 
Uh, and we made the decision, the legal team, I was the senior defense counsel, uh, only because I was only one of two <laughs> civilian counsels. The rest were military. I was the only non-military person actually with the case uh, who had no military experience because I was brought in to deal with the, the media uh, okay. and, and coordinate it and come up with alternative ways to put pressure on the government, like suing Congressman Murtha. So there were all sorts of nasty, totally inaccurate leaks coming out of the Pentagon, smearing our client. And I was in the case to shut those down, which I, I like to say and proud to say I did. Uh, but we put our client on 60 Minutes while he was being prosecuted, which from a yeah. criminal defense standpoint, it's unheard of. Yeah, normally that guy would be quiet. Yeah, and that's a very it was a very dangerous move. And I still can look back and go, wow, that was a really risky move. Um, but it worked. And it, 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 I mean, it, it could have gone really south, but it worked so really you, you, well. You leverage the court of public opinion, as yeah. you call it. Yeah, which we we did when we did the lawsuit against ultimately the, the lawsuit against Murtha went nowhere because he was determined to have immunity from hmm. suit. But when we filed that lawsuit, we did a press conference on the steps of the courthouse that got tremendous amount of press in, I wanna say 2006, I think when we filed it. Uh, I, I could have withdrawn and dismissed that case the same day we filed it and it would have been a successful effort. And we kept it going, I think for a couple of years, uh, just on legal issues. But every time we could, we had to deal with a legal issue, I could push the facts of the case to challenge what the public perception was, which was inaccurate by certain people like Murtha, who were, for whatever reason, just spreading disinformation. And we were able to counter that. And ultimately, our client uh, was, he, he ended up pleading guilty to, to one if I remember, I was out of the case by the very end because I wasn't a military trial lawyer. Um, but he was he pled guilty, I think, to one charge of. Um, I'm blanking out what the charge was. It was kind of like losing control of your men, uh, which was accurate and fair. Uh, and he you know, didn't serve at time in jail, um, you know, served multiple years, something like eight or nine years, even after being indicted, got promoted at one point. I mean, it was. It was such a messed up case. At the end of the day, the the NCIS agents, the uh, Naval Counterintelligence agents, uh, Naval Criminal Investigative Service agents, sorry, not counterintelligence, Naval Criminal Investigative Service agents ended up being our witnesses. They started as the government's witnesses. They were still NCIS agents, and they ended up testifying for us instead because the case had been so screwed up by the government. Wow. It's a good case study to show how how what not to do, how not to do it, and and also how you can leverage uh, cases against the government, even in criminal matters. What would have happened to him if uh, all the lawyers didn't intervene on his behalf, if he didn't get this counsel to help him? Would he have ended up in jail? Uh, he he could have. He was facing decades of prison time. I mean, the, the government gave immunity to so many people thinking he was the guilty person and we're going to use him as an example, make an example out of him so we can show the Iraqi people and the rest of the world that we take these things seriously as, as we should because they literally massacred women and children. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. We, when, when we got access to a lot of the evidence, you know, we even we as the lawyers, we were trying to, you know, figure out ways that, oh, you know, they did it accidentally. They didn't mean to do it. No trying way. To make, trying to make sense of it because it yeah. was just too, too horrible. I mean, there was there was one room in a house where nine women and children were were murdered. And, and I remember there was this one little kid in Mickey Mouse pajamas. And and you just can imagine they just would have been screaming. And we thought maybe they just sprayed the room with bullets because they were really scared kids. I mean, you know, they're in their early 20s, all these kids, maybe late teens even. And we really thought that they had just literally stuck the barrel of the M1 into the room and just sprayed it and accidentally killed everybody rather than looking in and, you know, seeing if there were any out 
Kaida fighters or whoever else. And no, when we got all the autopsy records and photos, I mean, whoever it was that went in that room, it was shot to the head, shot to the chest, shot to the head, shot to the chest, shot to the head, shot to the chest on them all, wow. on all of them. I mean, you had to have whoever it was stared them in the face as they killed them. And maybe you can mistakenly kill one of them when you first bursted, busted into the room, but all the rest, no. Now, that wasn't my client. Um, and so there were murderers and war criminals of some of within this group of Marines. And, and we have our suspicions, if not proof of who it was. And those guys got immunity. They were given immunity by the Defense Department because they originally thought it couldn't have been them. It had to have been our guy. And they and they and it wasn't. It, they, and they testified that it wasn't them. It was. Oh, they lied. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely committed perjury. Uh, and we proved that. In fact, at the Article 32, which is sort of like these preliminary hearings, uh, even the judge uh, went off on some of the government witnesses who had immunity, basically, if not explicitly, I'd have to go back to the decision, calling them, saying their testimony was just absolutely unbelievable, but not unbelievable. Like, oh, my God, that's so unbelievable. It's like you're a liar, man. You and are lying. When somebody gets immunity like that from the government, that's irreversible. Yeah, that was it. Once it's the stamp is on the paper, it's done. At least in those cases. I mean, you always anyone who watches Law and Order knows that, you know, you could get immunity as long as you you tell the truth. But there are cases where, you know, here you go. Here's here's your get out of jail free card forever. And and that's what it was for for. I mean, there are there are murderers walking free. Sure. And and just because they were Iraqi kids, you know, they're no less valuable human that's beings. Horrible. Yeah, I mean, it, it was I, I'm I mean, I can discuss this story and I will start tearing up. I mean, literally, because I remember what these I wish I had never seen these photos. I'm sure um, it, it was horrible what they did. It just wasn't my guy. And which is important. I think that's what's so valuable about our Constitution. People that talk ill of our country and our form of government don't have a concept of how we, unlike most people on the planet, can pull this one person out of this story and say well his life is valuable too even though maybe the greater good of like global peace or politics we could hang him and it might look good to the iraqi government but we have this idea that an individual is still valuable and in this case not worthy of being taken up to this sacrificial altar for some governmental bullshit. yeah if it hadn't been for the the legal team and and people like these NCIS agents who said, you know, wait a second, the evidence forensically just doesn't match. It mm. can't be the way they said it was. Um, I mean, I learned so much for, from that case. It was fascinating. Um, I mean, literally was like an NCIS television show or or CSI where there were there wasn't like you know, laser stuff and things like that, that was making a difference. But you, you just figure the slightest things like, you know, you read in the reports what happened and you might see some photos of the area. But I remember part of my team went to Haditha. I wasn't going to go. The war was still on. I'm like, screw that. I know <laughs> I, I'm a well-paid. I'm not lawyer. going. I'm not... <laughs> no way in hell am I going. I'm not. I'm not. Hey, you know, U.S. military, you had your chance when I applied to be in you and you declined. So I'm not going to Iraq. Uh, so my other lawyers were all Marines. So they went. Um, but I remember being on the satellite phone with them while they were there. And they're like, this is incredible. Like the the one road they were on where the, the initial convoy got hit by an IED and where the first firefight happened. He's like, they're they're like telling us, this is so different than what we had ever thought it was because we had seen what was called the scan eagle footage, which at the time was classified and since declassified, declassified, which was the drone footage from mm. up above, which actually was filming some of the activity uh, at, after the initial bombing. But uh, this this white car pulled up and they killed these five Iraqi military age males. Uh, 
before they even said anything to them. They literally just opened fire because they had received a warning the day before to be on the lookout for a white car that could be a vehicle improvised explosive device. And well, every freaking car in Iraq was like white. It was like all the same cars. So what kind of intel is that? That's ridiculous. And these Marines in the, the so I think the second truck got blown up. So the first truck stopped, obviously, got out. The, the, the white car pulled up, pulled to the side of the road. And the Marines in that first vehicle, one of them at least, just ran over and started gunning these guys down. And then my guy was in the third truck and he ran to help. And they accused my guy of killing these guys. Well, what what we didn't know at the time until we went there was I remember vividly the guys like it's a hill there. It's a hill. We didn't really because you're looking at it from above. So, you you know, it looks flat, sure. but it, it was actually like at this huge steep. So there was no way that our guy had been able to get there in time, you know, wearing 40 pounds of equipment running up a hill and then shoot guys that were blocked by the car because the car would have been at the angle. And so it was this forensic resolution, at least for this one shooting, the first shooting, that it turned out at most our guy killed one guy, which by that time would have been legal, was deemed legal because the other Marines had already started shooting. And the, the rule of law, you know, if your other one Marines in a firefight, you, you don't ask questions. Hey, wait a second, dude. Did you have probable cause? You know, obviously, which is not a thing in the military in war. But, you know, what was your basis for shooting on these people? If the guy's shooting, you go on, you help them and you just start shooting. But they were all killed by this one same guy. Four out of five, I think, were killed by this one guy unlawfully. It was and he, totally and he, and he, and he never got immunity. Was held accountable. Nope. He got immunity. So it was amazing to to learn and watch uh, and, and and take the evidence forensically going through it bit by bit. Uh, and and which is why these NCIS agents turned. I mean, I I doubt many. Many lawyers have had it where the government's own investigators have turned against the government I, in turn set, makes it sound bad. It was it was a heroic thing. They changed their yeah. opinion once they saw and, and dug all these facts up. I mean, these these were guys who did the right thing because they That's went great. where the evidence led them. And they stood up and said, the king has no clothes. No, we're, we're not going to say this guy. We're not going to railroad this this young Marine, this 24 year old Marine who was his literally first firefight. It's crazy. Let's change gears a little bit. Uh, you you mentioned Kennedy. Let's talk a little bit about that. That's always a, a amazingly interesting topic. So you, like millions of other people, intrigued by his assassination. Yeah. Well, um, since I was a little kid, can't tell you why. Why I had this strange obsession with famous murders and disasters. So the Titanic, the Hindenburg, the Lind Lindbergh baby kidnapping, Lincoln assassination. President Garfield assassination, President McKinley assassination, just always fascinated by these, these events that shaped history. And the JFK case, of course, the most recent of those I just rattled off, uh, and probably the most controversial uh, as far as what was involved. And I got involved as a kid in the 70s, in the Mm, mid 70s literally i remember when i was about seven years old reading books on the kennedy assassination and the warren commission report and as i got older into high school into college and then law school i became friends with a lot of the authors who, are, who have written many of the top books i got to meet and hang out with witnesses i mean i had drinks with marina oswald uh, at one point and uh, as i became a lawyer i was you know, I'm 25 years old. I was doing a lot of public speaking on the case, uh, radio, television, conferences. Uh, and uh, I then started representing a lot of the authors in Freedom of Information Act cases. Uh, I rep ended up representing one of the Secret Service agents who was in the follow-up car with President Kennedy, who was accused of killing President Kennedy by accident. And we represented him in a defamation case 
That led to me representing two other Secret Service agents, another one who was in the motorcade. So I had two of them from who were actually in Dallas when the president was murdered. Uh, and I, now I, my my view on the case has absolutely changed since I was younger. It has matured. So I honestly don't get involved in the theories that much anymore because I I don't. I don't think it's going to be solved either. It, it already has been solved, uh, but it's clouded too much by disinformation hmm. uh, because too many people came up with all these other weird, wild theories that it's clouded everything. You can't tell, you know, what's, what's real, what's not. <clears throat> sure. So, you know, we, we had a joke and still have a joke that, uh, you know, we've identified 121 of the three assassins that were in Dealey <laughs> Plaza that day. And it's literally that bad. Uh, but I still I still work uh, on the case and uh, help get the documents declassified. I'm all about transparency. Uh, I don't I don't a lot of times or certainly in this case, I don't care what the documents say. I leave that to others. But I want the records released so that people can review them and then come up with an informed decision. And that was a lot of the problems in the early days because so much of the evidence was withheld from the public that people had to just, you know, fill in the gaps. And, and a lot of times they filled in the gaps incorrectly and that stuck and that, that caused problems to, you had to, you really had to get rid of the, the, the fake stuff first. What's uh, fake? What's some fake stuff in there? Yeah. Case? And, and fake. And I don't, I don't mean it in a way like people, intentionally did things although that happens too but I, i'll give you an, a, an example uh, we'll stick with the with the military um so oswald being an, an ex-marine when he served in the marines he joined in 1957 56 57 served for for two years uh as he was a i think a private i don't remember if he got uh promoted or not to a pfc but um he contracted uh vd venereal disease when he was in the Marines. And uh, the the records uh, show that it says not in line of something I'm going to I may have to paraphrase a little bit, uh, not due to own misconduct, not in line of duty. And that created a lot of controversy back at the time. I think that document was even in the Warren Commission report uh, in the exhibits. And you had a lot of, I mean, you remember, you're thinking back, this is 1963 that it happened. The Warren report comes out in September of 64 with all the hearing volumes right afterwards. Mm -hmm. So people are going through this in 64 and 65. And that means a lot of the people who did this, you know, were almost all, a lot of, certainly the guys had been in the military because they had been in World War II and they'd been in Korea uh, starting in Vietnam, but they had mandatory military service. So, you know, most of the guys had some military service and you would the, the the people who were the first generation researchers were like oh no way i was in the military there's no way you get vd and it says not due to own misconduct not in line of duty you know in line of duty i'm sorry it said not due to own misconduct in line of duty and they're like you get court martialed if that happens you know you're in so much trouble if that happens there's no way and the and the theory was that this was a a, a cover for Oswald for his intelligence activities, right? That he was working for U.S. intelligence and that he might have been a false defector to the Soviet Union when he defected there in 1959 until 1962. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember seeing that. And when I started to look at things in the 80s and into my law school years, I'm like, you know what? In order to solve this case, we need to unsolve the earlier theories we need to push aside what was wrong so we could solve and come up with what is right so mm. i took that one on and i started to do a lot of research about what do those words mean and i i did legal research on military law i contacted folks in the military uh the jags the judge advocate generals the the lawyers in the military and it had, you know, they didn't know I was talking about Oswald or anything. I, I was asking about this, this wording, this designation, what would that mean? And, and it turned out that they were still in, 
when I was doing this almost 30 years after the assassination, they were still using the same language. And it was literally legal terminology. It, it meant that Oswald had, had properly reported that he contracted VD at, while he was an active duty Marine, and he would receive VA benefits, medical benefits for the, the affliction, uh, for the disease, as you know, he would move on in life. So if you know, whenever he would have left the Marines, he could have gone to a VA hospital and still be treated for the VA for the VD. Now, does it does it not does it mean that it wasn't some sort of subterfuge? No, you know, I can't disprove a negative, but I can come up with a plausible Occam's razor mm -hmm. explanation mm -hmm. to say this means nothing, guys. You know, you're 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 barking up the wrong tree right. here. Right. Um, now, the problem with doing that back 30, now 30 years ago, was a lot of these theories were created by revered, very respected first generation researchers. And two things would happen. Either the people who challenged those revered researchers would, would be attacked because how dare you attack Right. You know, the revered that's people. Mark Zaid. You know who he is? Yeah. So yeah, he wrote the. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not at the time it was they were attacking me saying, who the hell are you? You know, attacking, you know, challenging this first generation researcher or the if the first generation researcher were still alive, which at the time they still could have been. And some still are even, you know, they're 60 years later. You know, they're they're in their 80s, 90s. Um, it was, you know, they were unwilling to move off of their theory hmm. for self-interest, which doesn't help the case, right? Doesn't help it at all. Uh, and so I, I got so fed up with that, that, that people weren't willing to accept different views within the conspiracy community um, that I, I withdrew, except to still help get the records declassified. So for the last 30 years, I have been helping get the records declassified and, and I will say successfully. So, I mean, I'm mm. proud, I'm proud of that, but it, you know, are, who, I'm, as those, far as I'm concerned, Lee Harvey Oswald did it and I, and I'm good with that. Well, that's because you're part of the conspiracy. Mark. Oh, I, there's, there's no doubt about it. That, so that that's is like always often like said, the, that's the <laughs> that go-to as well. Like in any of these discussions, as yes. soon as you change your opinion, well, you're just part of it. You're just covering up. You've been paid off. You just, there's, you've got some, you've probably gotten cases out of it or some <laughs> judge who was, whose uncle was there that day, got you out of it. It's, it's very interesting to me, these kinds of discussions, be it uh, the president's assassination or, or any thing that gets conspiracy wrapped around it it seems like so many of the people that have all the facts uh usually have very limited understanding of how government actually works usually a very limited understanding of like uh, even how simple things are so i have a, a background that revolves around some politics and i talk about some of my experiences to people and they're like but but like who put you there or like, yeah. like what meeting did you go to where they allowed you? And it's like, it doesn't really work that way. Like you just decide you're going to do something like what gave you the authority to start researching this stuff? Well, I started opening books and magazines yeah. and, going, and, and making phone calls. I, right? I, I still, and I think the first time I heard that when I heard people accusing me of being CIA was at the 30th anniversary conference in Dallas in 1993. And I was speaking it. at it and I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And I still get accused of that now, 30 years later. You're uh, just out there sowing seeds to keep that, people off the yeah, trail. That I'm CIA. Crumbs. And, and it's just so funny because but, this. But maybe you are. I mean, that whole. Yeah, that, hey, right. I can't. That whole that bullshit not... thing behind you. None of those are law books. That that wall yeah. actually goes to a secret room with microfiche in it. But it's so funny when I represent people at the CIA and they come they come to me and they're like, you know, my agency hates you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, OK. So, right. It's one of those things where like you, I, I can say I know I'm doing the right thing because both sides think I'm against them or part of the other. So clearly I'm in the middle as far as I'm concerned. That's exactly where I want to be. I want to be in the middle holding both sides accountable. 
Yeah, humans like to attach. I, I posted something the other day. Um, San Jose, California just passed a city ordinance that is requiring firearm owners to purchase a liability insurance in case their gun is used uh, and it causes injury. So I shared something about that and um, I don't agree with it, but uh, a lot of the people in San Jose uh, that are for it are using uh, mandatory driver's insurance, vehicle insurance as a way to, you know, argue and it's a, it, it, for, it. hey, you can have this $50,000 vehicle that could kill a whole group of students and we force people to have insurance for that. Why not do the same? And I look at people commenting on this and like people are quoting case law and it's like, no, you're not quoting case law. You're quoting some dude on Twitter's interpretation of a case he read about like that's not case law like that that's like what you're talking about and then this stuff becomes folklore where it's repeated so many yeah. times oh yeah i i stop reading comments on twitter and rarely engage with people because you know most of them are anonymous some of them are bots some of them You've are got like are 112 000 twitter followers 100 and, ah, i'm like 122 000. Oh, okay which, sorry to me to take which, hey take 10, take 000 000 people. Away from but you know it doesn't i mean I, I tell you, a ton of them are fake because I can see Twitter with its algorithm now going after fake accounts, mm -hmm. uh, either bot accounts or just fake accounts to whether I, you know, I don't know who they are. Are they Russian? Are they alt right, alt left? No idea. But they're they're clearly fake. And I see new accounts following me and then disappearing yeah. all the time, uh, much more so than ever before. But I stopped. I stopped arguing with folks on Twitter because it was it was raising my blood pressure because I'm arguing with people who have no have no idea what they're talking about. Now, if it, hey, if there was someone who's identified as themselves and they're a lawyer or have some sort of special background experience, that's one thing. But I mean, and sometimes that is I was <laughs> I had like a four hour argument with John Cusack, the hmm. actor on Twitter four or five years ago, and we were arguing about Ed Snowden and, and national security whistleblowers and what the process is. And this guy is arguing with me about what I do for a living and okay, as, a, as a recognized expert. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? And he would say, you know, this is what should happen. I'm like, that's not how it works. You that's, know, it, that's funny. So uh, side note, whenever anybody cares what a court jester's opinion is on national security or the economy or anything i mean that's just silly like i don't care what an actor's opinion is on certain things that you're there to entertain me and give me yeah, something I, to watch on tv and it, it was I, I i remember i remember some people i was watching the comments about our discussion and I think he blocked me twice during the conversation, then unblocked me <laughs> in rage. And then, yeah. And then start our and the conversation was just going downhill through throughout it. You could just see it that something something was going on. <laughs> but I remember one person writing, it's like, yeah, look, look at the actor trying to school the national security attorney on national security law. It's like now it doesn't mean you can't have differences of opinion. And some of them are policy and you could have definite different opinions on policy. You know, if I'm telling you what the law is, it, you know, please at least get a law degree to challenge me on on what that is or cite to someone who right. is a lawyer, who is an expert on if it. You're an adjunct I could professor be wrong. at what law school? Uh, well, at Johns Hopkins, uh, not yeah. at the law school in, in the uh, government national security master's okay. program, okay. global studies program Yeah, okay. for last eight years. OK, so. That's pretty funny, but, that, but that's telling people get so emotionally invested. Like you are deeply involved in uh, the what happened at the Capitol. Uh, what it be two years now? I've lost uh, track year, of so much. Year, yeah, January sixth of a year yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. like it, there, I shared something on that, and you just mentioned alt right, alt left. Uh, it's amazing how people will take a look at something like that, disregard all facts, form an opinion based on their deep health beliefs of what government should or shouldn't be, and then dismiss really 
horrible behavior by people because they're just pissed at like the government or pissed at the economy. Like, I don't like much about our government, but I don't think people should just be able to go uh, vandalize and terrorize public property either. People, this will piss right. people off when they hear me say this. Like, oh, you were, you're you're like somebody the other day, and I don't care what your political views are, but somebody I shared a picture with my wife on the internet for her birthday. This is my beautiful wife, blah blah blah. And mm-hmm. somebody just wrote, "Look at these two Democrats." Yeah. Well, I'm not a Democrat, <laughs> but if I was a Democrat, I'm like, just look at that, like. The hell does a picture of me and my wife on the beach have to do with politics or anything? Yeah. <laughs> I, I get that. I get that all the time. I get called, you know, look at this liberal, whatever, this Democrat, whatever. I, I have never been, I've been a registered independent my entire life. Uh, I have represented the Republican National Committee. The RNC was my client for a bit of time. The Daily Caller was my client. The Wall now, Street now you Journal did my work client. for a lieutenant governor that was a Democrat, didn't you? I did. Yeah. In New York, clerked. when I was in law school, because yeah, clerked. that was yeah. who was it was an internship in law school. And that's who was in power at, at sure. the time. I've represented Republican members of Congress. I've represented tons of Republicans, tons of Democrats. And I can't stand politics. Uh, I, 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 I'm not a fan of either side. Yeah. You know, I thought. I thought defund police was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I, I, I love representing law enforcement. Um, you know, what, defund police is just ridiculous. So there's an alt left hmm. theory that is unworkable. You want to mm-hmm. reform police? I'm all for it. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can do to reform the police. Which should uh, be happening at a state level for the uh, most, most part. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, it's, obviously there's federal law enforcement and, you know, it's a lot of the same type of attitudes uh, that exist and we just need to deal with. Uh, but it's much more at the state level, of course. And then, yeah, on the alt right, you know, January 6th is not acceptable. You know what what happened that day? You Whether you want to get into the facts of was it a, a, a conspiratorial coup? Was it organized? Was it planned? You know, OK, we can we can get into those facts to see where it led. Uh, were some of those people probably just swept up into it? Oh, yeah, I have no problem believing that. Someone who was probably a very law abiding, never did anything, but was incredibly, you know, really on one side, uh, you know, for support of that day um, and then just walked into the building with everybody else and didn't probably didn't do anything other than be there. OK, still a crime and not mm-hmm. acceptable, not acceptable at all uh, with what happened. So, you know, how, real, why is that real, real difficult quick, to pause understand? that thought? What is it that you're involved with in the totality of that story? You're representing somebody or some people? Yeah, or some so organization? I have three clients. Uh, the first client was not even known at the time and actually only became known fairly recently. And, and that was one of the top intelligence officers for the Capitol Police. Okay. Uh, she's now the acting chief of intel. Uh, for the Capitol Police. And at the time, uh, she she just came on the job in October before January of last year. And they were trying, sh- she and another colleague who were also hired at the same time, were trying to reform the intel unit of the Capitol Police. You know, how to get more information coming in, what to do, how to act on it. It was a very small shop uh, before January 6th. And it it failed, just like the rest of the federal government did that day on Mm -hmm. many different levels, uh, because it should never have happened, obviously, what happened. Uh, And she became a whistleblower. She she came to me and I helped make sure she had knowledge of what information Capitol Police knew before January 6 and what other agencies knew and what wasn't acted on. So I started representing her to make sure that she could lawfully report to oversight officials, both within the Capitol Police and Congress, what she knew. And it was a totally successful representation. Nobody retaliated against her. She was able to say everything she wanted and and there have been reforms and she's still in the position. She's actually even in a higher ranking position now. Then I started representing uh, two of the officers who were injured, that were in that day, uh, Officer Harry Dunn, uh, African American. He was the first to speak out publicly, and then First Sergeant uh, Aquilino Ganell, who was injured 
uh, and is still injured and will always be injured, uh, unfortunately, as a result of what happened. So when the January 6th Select Committee held its hearing, there were four officers who testified, two Metropolitan Police Department officers, uh, Hodges and Fanon, and then two Capitol Police officers. I represent the two Capitol Police officers. Why did they need representation? Were they being uh, accused of something? No, no. It it was, preca- I'll say, precautionary and maybe offensive more than defensive. It was to make sure that they could tell their story properly, lawfully. We wanted them to be able to be interviewed by the media and 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 Congress, if need be, and say their story without fear of retaliation by their department. Because look, if you work for the federal government, if you work for any company, you can't just go out and publicly criticize your company. Now, I give an example all the time. There was a guy a couple of years ago, two, three, four years ago, whatever it was, uh, he, he did a YouTube video uh, playing a guitar, singing about how bad Starbucks is, just just lashing out at Starbucks. Turns out he was a Starbucks employee. They fired his ass. Of course, you know. And it's like, hello, if you want to criticize someone, don't work for them mm-hmm. unless you're in a you're a federal government employee, and I make arrangements for you to go and speak out on your speak your mind within parameters. So everything was negotiated and and worked out in advance. Let, let me so ask that a they question could... just so the folks listening and watching understand. This is a misconception that most people have. The Starbucks employee, he got fired, right? Yep. Uh but that was a violation of his first amendment right, wasn't no, it? No, no. And why? I and, and perfect why, and why was because it's it? not the government. The first amendment right. applies to the government. It doesn't not apply to, to private you and me. So you and me, no, we we can we can't violate someone's First Amendment rights. If I say you shut up, you know, if you cut my mic off, you're not violating my First Amendment rights unless you're unless you're the secret government agent, which is the which same as be. if Twitter says uh, we right. don't like what Mark's saying and they delete your post. It's yeah, not nope. it's not a First Amendment violation. Nope, not at all, not at all, because it's their platform; they're in charge of it now. And this is this is why I. I can't stand these Facebook ads that they're running to rehabilitate their uh, their their reputation, where they keep saying we wish the government would just come in and give us regulations and things like that. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm sure they want that because that would then give them cover to say, well, we're we're doing this to you because the government told us to. The government mm-hmm. put these restrictions. But one of the reasons, one of the good reasons why the government has not imposed. Uh, certain limitations on Facebook is because there's First Amendment issues. And it's really, really complicated for Congress to pass laws. That's what the First Amendment says. Congress may may cannot make or whatever, you know, shall not make or whatever the language is. I don't have it memorized uh, laws that that infringe on the First Amendment. So when you're a federal employee, you don't give up your First Amendment right, but you are legitimately You don't don't have a constitution book? I do. I uh, I do somewhere. <laughs> I, I I know I do have a somewhere in my drawer. I'd have to look around, <laughs> but somewhere I know there is one. I have a little mini one. Uh, but as a good lawyer, I have learned I that. Um, let let I me just have, read it I don't, so people I don't know. memorize it. Amendment one: Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech. Yeah, or of Congress press, shall or... make no. That's the key words. And I love when people always say, "Hey, First Amendment." It's because that amendment is so important, it, and it is a really important amendment. I, I litigate against it probably more than any other amendment. But I love if you read history, like we were talking about these people who are uninformed. If you actually study the Constitutional Convention. The First Amendment was the Third Amendment. There were two other proposed amendments before it that got shot down uh, and and didn't get passed. So the Third Amendment became the First Amendment. So it's not the it's not the First Amendment because it's it's more important than all the others. It was just the way it it got placed in order, which I think is kind of another one of these things that become folklore where people misunderstand. I hear somebody say that 
And then I repeat it and then somebody yeah. else repeats it and it just becomes looked at as common knowledge. Oh, so yeah. I, I mean, you have to do a lot of research. I derailed you a little bit no, no, because no. I, I want it. I, I think that that's something, especially having a lawyer that deals in it just to have people here. We I I frequently challenge people to read something like this, go back and or grab your kids. If you're a parent, grab your kids civics book. That, that they're reading in grade school and just read through it. I think if people understand that stuff, you'll have a much better under uh, appreciation for the conversation that we're having, what you do, et cetera. So go back to the to the case is what you were talking. Yeah. About. So it it's what I was talking about when we first started the conversation on the pre publication review issues and, and how I met Fred. Um, it's it's about making sure that these individuals have a First Amendment right to exercise. Now, for folks who are outside the government, the limitations that exist is you can't publish classified information, but you have a First Amendment right to publish everything else, unless it's statutorily prohibited. Like if you're if you knew grand jury information, by law you can't you can't disclose that uh, by statute. But so for these police officers. They can't just go out and and talk about what they saw, what they did, what they think about that day without permission. So we secured permission. I, I worked with the Capitol Police. I said, you know, this was a unique event. They need to tell their story. They really it's important for the United States and our democracy for people to know what really happened and, the, and what we have seen in the year since with all the disinformation with with all the reinvention of I mean, God, for it's on video, you could see how violent it was. You know, this wasn't a bunch of tourists just walking into the Capitol. This is really violent. And I'm amazed that so that more people were not seriously injured or killed. I mean, I give the, the most credit to the officers that only one person was shot. I mean, the 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 ability of the officers to refrain from shooting in that context and it makes sense i mean they were so outnumbered if they had started shooting who the hell knows what would have happened uh but it wouldn't have been good for anybody it would have been horrible on either side but you know they 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 withheld uh that and and i you know it's hard i don't know it's hard to think about you know which would would we have done the same um, of course i'm not a trained law enforcement officer so who the hell knows but um you know i i am would say, I mean, my guys have never been in trouble. They're they're not in trouble now. And that's because I was there. I, I've been representing them along with a colleague, David Lofman, uh, who's been really helping me tremendously uh, and was the lawyer who was at the hearings because I, I actually was out of town. But uh, the fact that they are still speaking out and still serving members, proud serving members of the U.S. Capitol Police Force is that that's what my role was. What are some things about that that they want the public to know that maybe is just too muddied or buried by the press or by the untruths like you talked about with the with the case uh, with with uh, Kennedy? Yeah, I mean, it's astounding what is being distorted. Um, I mean, I'll give you one example because it could lead to legal action. I mean, we're exploring it, but uh, there was a protester who died, uh, a particular protester who died that day because she had a heart attack. Um, and my guys and others performed CPR on her to try and save her life. But unfortunately, uh, she passed away. And there are uh, a group of very outspoken you know, alt-right folks who are accusing uh, particularly one of my clients of murdering this woman, that they intentionally killed her. Uh, and it, it's disgusting. Uh, it's absolutely disgusting. Uh, and we're looking at whether we're going to go after them. I mean, these are these are difficult cases always. I mean, I've been for defamed. Def defamation. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just, well, you know, they're in other states. You know, do they have assets? You know, you know, is it sometimes you got to decide, is it worth it? You know, is is it worth going after these people? Because 
they're, they're still, you know, you'll feed them more oxygen. It's like feeding a fire and, mm -hmm. and you give them more oxygen, you know, but sort of like the, the Alec Jones lawsuit that he's lost out of uh, Sandy Hook, uh, you know, where he was saying it was no kids were killed in the elementary school and it was all set up. And, and the, the families of the little children who were killed sued him and won. And, you know, that's a really difficult case, but it was so I don't extreme. think I heard anything about that or paid any, oh, yeah. paid any attention to that. I don't, there's a lot of stuff I just ignore. Alex Jones <laughs> yeah, said was, that no children were killed in the Sandy Hook yeah. murder. Yeah, and he was that's, sued and they had a absurd. trial and he lost. Uh, and I think they're dealing with damage issues now. It, it, as I recall, I don't, I'm not sure where, where I think they're at the damage stage or, or they're trying to an execute, or maybe he appealed. Now I'm not but, sure how I feel about that. I mean, I'm entitled to have an opinion and I understand now when somebody's <clears throat> got a platform where millions of people hear, uh, hear them, you, are you held to a different standard than somebody who's not, are we not entitled to have, am I not entitled to be wrong? Am I not entitled to have a, a false opinion or a wrong opinion? Because I'm just an ignorant, ignorant asshole, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, the, where's look, the there, line there? I mean, there there is a line. Um, you know, some of it is actually what we call per se defamation. There are certain things where if you accuse someone of criminal activity, that's per se defamation. Like you don't have to even show specific intent. If I say that, you know. Uh, you know, I, I just I want to come up with something that that might not strike factually. Uh, say if I if I say to somebody, hey, you know, uh, I understand your your family member died last week. I think you murdered them. Hmm. You know, that's per se defamation, obviously, unless they did murder them. Um, that you know, I could just be saying it out of ignorance or stupidity. Um, versus. You know, there's differences, and this is the case going on right now. Sarah Palin versus the New York Times. She's a public figure. Um, that's a different standard. You have to be able, you have to show malice against the New York Times. And this is a, an incredible, very rare First Amendment uh, defamation trial. It's not First Amendment, but First Amendment, it gets lumped into that. Because uh, again, it's not the government. New York Times is not the government, um, but it's a first freedom of speech type case uh, from defamation. Uh, and it's going to go into what was their malice, which was actually in the editorial section, the uh, the yeah, the editorial section of the newspaper, not the news section, uh, as to whether or not uh, Sarah Palin, um, if her words or I'm trying to think what it was, I think she wrote an op-ed or her words had had influenced the gunman who who shot Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, mm -hmm. uh, which it was factually incorrect. Absolutely, the New York Times op-ed page was editorial page was absolutely wrong and they corrected it and apologized but then she sued and so you know what what does malice uh what is considered to be malice uh which a jury will be deciding uh very soon but um so you know if you know people can this this here's the notion did uh you know the folks who were there on january 6 had every right to protest hmm. Uh, I mean, you might have had to get a permit to protest in certain areas, obviously, but, you know, that's that's easy to do uh, because that's what our country is all about. Lawful protest. And it's when you start unlawfully protesting. It's like I, I don't get this. The, the alt right, alt left issues with this. Again, I go down the middle. You know, the folks who go to the the, the fighting that was going on in Oregon uh, with the with Black Lives Matter. Uh, I don't I don't know who the people were, but you start smashing stores, your ass should be in jail. You get right. arrested. That's not acceptable. I don't care what you're protesting. I don't right. I don't care who might have been killed intentionally, accidentally, racist or not. What you start doing that, you start unlawfully acting, you trespass, you hurt someone, you should be prosecuted. It's crazy how so many people on uh, in that case, the alt left, the left said, this is the only, I have family members. This is the only way that they can be heard. They're destroying yeah, no, not like, acceptable. across America, or that's why there's insurance. Now that's just like the most insane argument to try to w w wipe away really bad property crimes and crimes against people because there's insurance or they don't have a good way to communicate. 
not my problem, nor is right. it the store clerks or the people who lost their businesses or homes or, or who had to live in fear for months while their cities were on fire. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's unacceptable. And, and I, I hate the fact that, that it's been made political and ideological, you know, mm -hmm. so that you, you know, it's always, it's what about ism right now. You talk to somebody on the right, it's like, well, what about the black lives matter? movement and what they did in Oregon and, and the same thing you talk to the other folks on the alt left and it's like what about January 6th and it's like what about both of them folks mm -hmm. yeah you know, bad behavior is bad behavior I don't yeah. care what political parties on your your why your you did it ID it's, card it's not acceptable you know yeah. please go right ahead and lawfully protest I have no issue with that I may disagree you know there's a very famous case Skokie Illinois in the late 1970s that's, that's right down the road from yeah, me. I know right? the case well keep going and and the you know and they did a a, a TV movie I remember I remember the movie because it was Danny Kay, not not Danny Kay, ah who was enhanced Christian Anderson that was uh, Danny Dan Kay no yeah Danny Kay I'm, I was Danny Kay uh, I, it was Danny Thomas and Danny Kay sometimes confuse me Danny Kay Hans Christian Anderson one of my favorite actors as a child that I because I remember Hans Christian Anderson all the time the court jester such a great actor and he he played. He was in a role in this where he played one of the the Jews. I'm Jewish, so I'm going to say one of the Jews uh, who was in Skokie protesting against the Nazis and the mm -hmm. the neo Nazis had a a lawful protest in Skokie, Illinois, and it was a huge huge case because it reopened the debate. This is 30 years after the war, um, set World War II, and it reopened this debate. Do we allow this to happen? Do we allow Nazis to protest down our street, mm -hmm. revering Hitler? saying horrible things about about jews and homosexuals and minor other minorities and the answer is yes we do mm -hmm. we don't like it and you can counter protest against them but america freedom of speech as long as they do so uh safely and within whatever the permit allows yeah they can That's do it, it. The interesting thing about that quick factoid, if anybody's ever seen the Blues Brothers, which was filmed right about the same yes. time that that was happening, there was a whole group of neo-Nazis in the movie, which the movie was based around Chicagoland, which is where yep. I'm from. And they just like, because it was in the news at the time. Your point, at the time, injury, we looked at it different. Now, I, I feel a certain way about the things that you're doing. And now we have... And I'm not a, uh, uh, I don't want to go deep into it because I think it's Pandora's box, but hate crimes uh, and uh, the mere fact that somebody's got a Nazi uniform on walking in the streets, which I don't like, I think is shitty and bizarre in a million ways. That makes me feel a certain way. So I'm, I, 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 there's a crime against me just by this person doing this, right? Yeah. You know, I'd or love a, to walk up to someone in a Nazi uniform and punch them in the face. You know, my, I, my grandfather uh, was a rabbi in the U.S. Army, liberated Dachau concentration wow. camp. We, we had relatives killed by the Nazis. I'd love to go up and just punch the guy in the face. But what if it turns out that the guy was in a was an was an actor playing a role in a movie? And, and right. You, you can't just go and, and do that. Um, and I mean, you look at what happened in Charlottesville with the folks that were protesting. They were, you know, all the Nazis protesting. And that's where the young girl was run over by the car uh and murdered uh you know and you can't you can't do that you know you can't run people over with cars at protests regardless of which side you're on uh and um there was more there were more counter protesters to the protesters who were the mostly nazis or real alt-right uh combination and you know but i don't as far as i know i don't think anybody harmed physically harmed any of the neo-nazis they just, you know, screamed them down and yeah, uh, and everything. And that's that's the way the system works. And and boy, there's a lot of hated feelings, obviously, on both sides. But when the Nazis marched in Skokie, I think a lot, uh, quite a number of the lawyers who defended them and their right to protest, particularly from the I think the ACLU, were Jewish lawyers. And that's the part that why the law is so special. I'm not educating you, but. That's the point of the law. We're equal under it. And this is lawyers or, or folks will say, how could that lawyer represent that person? They're, they're a criminal. Well, that's what the law is all about is 
being represented, having protection. And I don't like that the these neo-Nazi jagoffs do this, but if I say that's not allowed, then is uh, worshiping a certain way not allowed because I feel that way is uh, watching a certain movie or reading a certain book or magazine not allowed. And that's the, the slippery slope. Yeah, right? all equal under the eyes of the law. When I first started practicing, I was an assigned public defender for a few months in upstate New York handling these criminal cases. And I will tell you, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's just say the vast majority of criminal cases, the, the guy's guilty. The defendant is guilty. Just, just that's the reality of it. But you don't go by that. You don't go by whether the person was was guilty or not. You go by, all right, what was the system that was in place? Did the police officers exceed their authority? Hmm. Because it's more important to ensure the system is held accountable um, than, um, than, than that the punishment of the one person. That's why they always say it's more important for, you know, 10 uh, innocent people to go free than one guilty person to be convicted. You know, it's, it's really important for the system to work. And that means that, that as long as people follow the law, that, uh, that they can be abided by it. Now, I'll tell you that just because you should have legal representation doesn't mean you're entitled to me as your lawyer. You know, criminal cases will be appointed a criminal defense attorney because it's important that someone has a lawyer, uh, but it's not going to be me. I'm not going to represent Nazis, but that's my choice. I don't mm -hmm. I don't I don't have to, but I'm not going to criticize the lawyers who are doing so because they're they're representing the system. They're not they're not necessarily representing the individual. They're representing the system. And it's important that lawyers do that. It's hard for us to separate emotion and so much of that's how we were raised. You're Jewish, somebody that's maybe a person of color. They start to, anybody, myself, we all have these these things that were, uh, these concepts, ideas, worldviews that we were born into. To separate ourselves from that is is hard. It, it can be. and But that's where where folks start we start crossing over that line, regardless of what political persuasion you are. That's where we're at now. That just seems in our lifetime to be the worst that it's ever been. And, you know, I, I wasn't, I was alive in the sixties, but I, I was too young. So the sixties were pretty violent. And I mean, geez, in here in DC, they had massive riots and pro, you know, tons of, of criminal activity, especially after M Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, and um, there have been other periods of time, you know, down in the South in the 50s and 60s with lynchings and assassinations and, you know, lots of horrible things. But they seem to be fairly isolated to specific regions, specific cities because of specific events. Whereas now, I mean, it almost seems like we're at a point, you know, just after before or during the Civil War where everyone is so divided politically and doesn't care about following the laws on either side. Uh, and that's just unacceptable. And it's, you know, I, I really do think it'd be the downfall of our democracy, maybe not during our lifetime, maybe the next, but it's, it's, it's a wrong path. And I don't know, I, I'm not going to come up with a solution. I have no idea how to, how to fix this. Uh, but you could say, you can, you can watch it going, you know, it's like, it's like a train wreck as you're watching. As, you know, it's just it's it's on its way. It's happening clearly. Dem democracy or republic, Mark? Well, uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting to understand. You know, what really are we for a republic versus a democracy? And that gets really deep into understanding what the governmental system um, that was created with the founding fathers and the Federalist Papers and stuff, and and how we've shaped. I mean. As, as much as I think we are close, we're closer to our civil war times uh, as a country than ever before, we're also incredibly different from, from a legal standpoint, from a structural standpoint, <laughs> where the federal government is the powerhouse now, not the states, generally speaking, um, except on certain things, uh, versus back 150 years ago, where the federal government was very, very weak and all the power was really in the States. And you were loyal to your state, right? It was mm -hmm. the, the New York 16th Cavalry 
it was the Pennsylvania whatever, it was the Virginia whatever uh, division. And, and that's what you're part of, which, you know, if we if we had something now, I, I'm a New Yorker. I'm very loyal to New York, um, even though I've been outside of New York longer than I've been inside nowadays, age wise. But, you know, you, you might be in the New York National Guard or the Virginia National Guard, but you're part of the U.S. military. Right. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you don't I don't see us having guard against guard, state against state. It, it, I don't know what the hell is going I don't even want to think about it because it'd be a horrible situation. But uh, it, it's we're we're going down the wrong path uh, on both sides. A thousand percent. I think people just need to be, my opinion, more invest more in trying to understand when they're communicating with people or like what happened at the Capitol. I can look at and say what's really going on here. This is the uh, an outward expression of people that don't know how to be heard. Uh, in one sense, they're lazy because I've done lobbying, I've ran political campaigns, I've knocked on doors and handed people flyers, go vote for this guy or this girl. They don't wanna do that and work through our political process. So instead it's like a temper tantrum. Same with the people in, in Oregon or all the other cities that that rioted it's a temper tantrum on I'm, I'm not going to do the work to keep the republic alive I'm just going to be pissed off and go smash things and say it's my right but so I understand why they did it but I don't have to condone that that yeah. behavior can we not separate that stuff yeah and and I I go further and say I I think we should condemn right we it's not necessarily just not condone yeah yeah we we condemn 100% and say, agree no with that. not acceptable you know I don't have to agree with why they were protesting in fact I didn't I think I agree with most on both sides of of the protest I I but you know go right ahead and and protest that that's I think for fine. most people if they just said if that was my house or my street or my town or my car dealership or my my building or my family's how would i feel and of course you're gonna say i'd feel really pissed off or be really shitty like nobody i think it's too easy to just be dismissive when it's not your town on fire or uh people say well f government that's the the capitol building i own that well good if you're going to take ownership then you should be pissed off because i think that's the other part we don't feel like we are members of the republic of our society and we just like look like i'm not a servant to government I, I agree with you like these people owe me explanations not the other way around and i yeah. think we've kind of lost that where we don't look at ourselves as members of of the whole no yeah, i you know i agree i mean that's the beauty of of the election process, which doesn't mean it doesn't need reform with electoral process, which it definitely does. Uh, and, you know, all sorts of separate in that. And there's lots of room for disagreement. Reasonable minds can disagree on how to fix government and, you know, what to do. Um, but this right now we're, we're in a, we're in a downward spiral uh, mm. and I, and I, I'm concerned about our our system of government and where our country is going to go because you know it, it used to be i've been in dc now for 30 years that's crazy and uh like i said i i'm an independent i am i am nonpartisan. um but this is this is dc i'm again i'm from the new york city area dc is not a city as far as i'm concerned it's a it's a town it's a big town and <laughs> when you get to the work that i do it's a real niche and most of us know each other uh, within that niche. It's a small community within the intelligence community. It's a small community as far as really who has power and things like that. And you get to know if you don't know the person, you know someone who does and you're like one person mm -hmm. removed. And, you know, I, I was here. I came during the Clinton administration. I saw eight years of that. I saw eight years of the Bush administration. I saw eight years of the Obama administration, four years of the Trump administration. Now, a year plus of the Biden administration, people would go into government on the Republican or Democrat side. And then I, again, I'm always in private practice. So I would be working with all of the Republicans against the Democratic administration. Then it would switch. And then all the people who were in senior levels of power 
in the Democratic administration are now back in their law firms. And I'm working with all these Democratic lawyers against the Republican administration. Mm -hmm. Again, it wasn't against the Democrats or the Republicans. It was against whoever was in power. Mm -hmm. But we were all friends or certainly friendly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'd hang out with people who had been the attorney general of the United States because they're just a lawyer now mm -hmm. back in their law firm or assistant secretary this, undersecretary that, deputy director of whatever. And, you know, these most of the government folks, quite frankly, they go in and out of government all the time Yeah. when, when their party goes back and forth. You look who's in, in much of the same offices now in the Biden administration. They're all Obama people and Clinton mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, even... During the Trump administration, it was a lot of the people who from the Bush. Now, Trump is a is an exception on many, many levels because Trump did bring in lots of people who, frankly, were on the fringe and, and weren't part of the mainstream. That's what made it so different. But generally speaking, we were you were you were all friends. The, the people at that level, you know, someone who was under secretary of defense, regardless of Republican or or Democrat, they were probably. If they weren't friends, they knew each other very well and respected each other. Now, that doesn't mean someone didn't hate somebody. All, you know, Sometimes someone's an asshole and you just don't like them. Sure. And it doesn't matter what their party is. They just are. And, and my experience has been, if you think someone is, good chance a lot of other people think they are too, because they are. They're just, that's the way some, but most people, most people are not. And, and, and everyone would get along, but with... I, I don't know the sociological, psychological aspects of what was different with the Trump administration, but thing, you know, we all experienced things changing on both sides. The extremes got more polarized. And, and you know, I, I lost friends on social media. You know, you, we, we heard lots of stories about, you know, during the administration about going to Thanksgiving. You know, how do you deal with the other family members who you're on? opposite polar extremes regardless of what your view is on that issue how do you do that you know and, and trump didn't create this clearly you know he just manifested it uh for whatever through through whatever mechanism it, it's i mean it's fascinating from a sociological standpoint from a legal standpoint i'm just sticking to you know here's what the law is and this is what i'm going to do when i represent my clients and and i'm going to go against this administration. I go against every administration. I didn't do anything different in the Trump administration than I did in the in the Clinton, Bush, Obama, Biden administration. Same same stuff. I'm just as I get older, I know more people inside the government and I'm friends with them. Sounds hey, like a conspiracy. Yeah. In the Trump administration, I think I've pro I've represented more senior government officials in a in the Trump administration than I ever have in any other administration. Uh, I mean, undersecretaries, you know, the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, was a client of mine. As I said, Secretary Esper, the former Secretary of Defense, for almost two years or so in the Trump administration is a client of mine. Wow. And, and Chelsea Manning is a client of mine on the opposite extreme. And, and all three of those cases are all pre-publication review cases. I'm just getting out the information. Partisan politics is poison. It's been around since the beginning of, of our republic, and I think it's just worse and worse and worse. People yeah. need to, we need to demand from whoever we elect that they put the mission first and not party first. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm it's, with you 100%. I mean, I don't, I don't think... I don't think Republicans have all the answers by far. I don't think Democrats have all the answers by far. I think that uh, once we get so extreme on ideologies and viewpoints, it, it makes for bad policy, makes for bad business, makes for bad governing. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the look, there are there are conservative policies I very much support. There are liberal policies I support. There are progressive policies I support. But, you know, give me individual ask me about individual things. Uh, and, 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 you know, we can all reasonably differ on most of these things pretty much. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, but yet, you know, I, I think, I think the progressives are pulling the Democrats far to the left, which is a bad thing. Uh, and 
the alt-right has pulled the Republicans far to the right, which is a bad thing. And it's going to be bad for everybody. I, I would much rather get to be where you have, you know, right of center, left of center. And, you know, just slightly, and of which there could be really different views. You know, someone left of center could be a really different view than right of center. Could be fundamental, like abortion, like death penalty. You, I mean, it could be really moral, ethical, um, religious, legal. But, you know, for the most part, uh, you weren't, you, you, you still knew how to get along with your friends and family members when you had those conversations. Yeah. Or, or, or you understood how not to have those conversations. That doesn't Mark, seem to be the, the case anymore. The last couple of years, I have very close blood that has like written me off over disagreements on talking about covid or uh trump or and it's like i'm not i'm not pro covid pro trump anti covid anti trump but just having a discussion where we talk about and i i try not even to talk about politics around family or a lot of the goings on in the world because it's just so futile unless we're just trying to hear our own voices. Yeah. Um, but at family members that I haven't talked to in two or three years, yeah, because they they just are so vehement and and angry about the world not being as they think it should be, and it's like that's a pretty sad way to live. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, I agree. I don't I don't like that world now, unfortunately what are so all the things that you've done in your life we've been talking for a good long time so i'm gonna i'm gonna cut you loose here i like to end you've got a a very unique uh world view especially pertaining to uh freedoms in america what are some things or a thing that you have learned that you would leave our, our listeners viewers and then um before you do that tell people how to find you or get a hold of you if they need to yeah, the best way to reach me is on email. Uh, if you just Google my name, Mark Zaid, Z-A-I-D, mark at markzaid.com is my email. If you just Google me, you'll find my website and, and email. Or on Twitter, I'm at Mark S Zaid, E-S-Q, uh, which uh, amazingly pisses people off. To right. E-S-Q. There's, there's a, I don't know. Some people get Why really pissed piss off. off. I don't know. I don't get it. But you, if you search on Twitter, there I've been. It's not just me. I've seen other people get attacked for being ESQ on Twitter. I'm like, they're like, oh, that's so pretentious. Or I'm like, I'm sorry. I went to law school. I, I'm an ESQ. I don't understand what it is. Anyway, <laughs> that's a side story. But Mark S Zade ESQ on Twitter. Uh, I think what what I would I'd leave folks with, and what I have learned is, stand up for what you believe in. You know, don't don't shy away from helping your friends and and supporting what is right. Say the king has no clothes. I mean, I, for those I, of you, you that don't know what he's talking about, that's an old story. Old story, but right, the the king who was naked and you know he had all the power and everyone was scared around him, so everyone yeah. pretended that he was wearing clothes and like the tailor would make him an invisible suit and everybody would say how how majestic you look your highness until one little boy said wait a minute he's naked the king is naked and then finally everybody around is like oh my god he is i mean be that little boy i mean that's such i, I should research why that story came about and that and, was i'm actually reading about it right now i mean i remember that of course as a child the emperor's new clothes it was uh french written by who wrote this but it's such an important story stand up and and speak truth to power that requires action that's what i like what you just said that requires action people actually doing something not just talking about it yeah i did but it, it. you know it's important to take a risk taking risks i don't want people putting themselves into harm's way uh and you know, and I can understand it's difficult, you know, for, for the whistleblowers that I represent, it is difficult for them to do what they need to do, the right thing to do, but you got to do it the right way. Also, you got to do it lawfully. So, I mean, I created whistleblower aid, an organization in 2017 that provides pro bono legal representation to whistleblowers. And it was to make sure that they do things legally, not like Ed Snowden, 
uh, or Chelsea winner uh, and the rest. You don't illegally release classified information, but you support the people who try to do things the right way. And and your your collective voices do have power and you hold the government accountable. That's that's what I'm all about. Holding the government accountable, regardless of political party ideology, whatever it might be. Um, I dig it. It's not anti-government. You know, we need the government. We need the police. I respect them. Uh, I like I said, I represent them all the time. I love representing police officers and military members, and I love working with people in the government. And the vast, vast majority of people are great, honorable, trustworthy people, only wanting to do the right thing. But you get into this groupthink situation uh, <laughs> that a lot anyone who took political science and school probably learned where you know you go along with the masses and you and you're too scared to speak up now fight back against the bully but you know fight back obviously not i'm, I'm being uh sort of yes. rhetorical there you know you don't physically fight back against somebody because you then, have to unless you have to unless you're self-defense obviously which is which is legal <laughs> self-defense is legal um but you know I, stand up stand up and fight and you know exercise your constitutional rights uh but you know stay within the lines that's what the system that's how we all survive is if we do things the right way i i dig it i think holding government accountable we should also hold ourselves accountable as well absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. be willing to acknowledge you made a mistake you yeah. know sort of go back to what i was talking about with the kennedy assassination you know acknowledge that as you learn more facts you're like eh Maybe, maybe I wasn't right on that. You know what? I'm going to reevaluate. I'm going to put my self-interest aside um, and, and say this, this was not right. You know what we did. I mean, I do that all the, all the time. Um, we had a, a renowned scientist on yesterday, a uh, guy named Tim Crow, nutrition scientist out of Australia. And he talked about he himself, the basis of good science is being able to look at data, reanalyze it and change theories and hypotheses as new information comes about and said there were things that i look back that i wouldn't tell you now because there's new information that i have to discard old information yeah when it, we find yeah. it to be untrue or, or erroneous yeah they thought the world was flat for a while and i can understand why they did mm -hmm. at the time right you got a ship going on the horizon and it looks like it just disappeared that that's an illusion because they didn't we live on a sphere it's right. the earth is round they right. just went over to the other side unless yeah. you're talking to a flat earther yeah right Which you know the moon landing crazy. is fake and all all that good stuff i mean you know it's it's amazing what's out there you know now of course the, the kennedy assassination <laughs> i mean some of those folks were so off the the reservation but now the QAnon folks were were down in dallas uh waiting for rfk jr to come back <clears throat> excuse me and and lead them and i'm sorry people rfk jr is dead i'm sorry not rfk jr he is alive he is alive and like, well Wait, what i just listened <laughs> yeah, to him i apologize I, I don't i don't agree with rfk jr that's why he was on my mind jfk jr sorry okay. people jfk jr they were expecting him to come back and he is dead he is unfortunately and sadly really really dead that's such a somber way to, to end. We, yeah, we need I just to, was like, Meh. okay, Hans uh, Christian Andersen. I don't know yeah. why. I was, One I was, of the best look. movies ever. I love it. I, I encourage people to show it to their kids. Danny that Kay is, who, is that awesome. Is who also wrote the book, The Emperor's New Clothes, uh, which he wasn't French. He was Dutch. I was Dutch. reading something in French, but Hans yes. Christian Andersen wrote the book. Most of you, your parents probably read it, but it was about a swindler that, yeah, got that emperor to where yes no clothes and that's that right sold them sold them a bill of goods and it's it's uh okay to to sometimes speak out against the masses i think that was really what what hans christian anderson was was trying to tell the the readers yeah, yeah right the, the ugly duckling the whole those stories yeah. all hans christian they're, anderson yeah they're ama amazing stories there's all good stuff for kids and adults to read I appreciate you taking the time, Mark. There's, I mean, there's a, a thousand other questions I would ask you. Maybe in the future we can can cut into your schedule and get you to do it again. No, no, it'd be great. I mean, we can talk about the work I did to to see working for Mohammed Al Fayed about Princess Diana's death. Was she murdered or was she not? Or 
who was D.B. Cooper. I got a litigation to solve the D.B. Cooper skyjacking, uh, the anthrax vaccination program when I helped shut that down 20 years ago uh, for the mandatory That's a program. big one. I, I did some research on that because when all of the anti-vaccination stuff came about, there's several times in our history going back 100 years or more. And then mm -hmm. that one were government mandated vaccines that people have either totally forgot about, dismissed or didn't know about. And yeah, that's a that's a big one. Clinton well, was mandating the, yeah. the anthrax vaccine. The Clinton and then into the Bush administration. And, yeah. Uh, and we shut it down during the Bush administration. But yeah, happy. We got we got I always have tons of really cool stuff to talk about. I'm happy to come back. We're going to do it again. You guys that have listened, uh, we appreciate you. If you are looking for more information, if you just Google Mark Zaid's name, you will definitely uh, find tons of information on him. You'll hear him on numerous news broadcasts. You can read about different cases that he's worked on. And I think the big takeaway here today is go dig out some facts and then take action on them. Don't just be a loud mouth and, and repeat things that maybe you heard that are kind of true because your cousins, neighbors, brothers, dogs, plumbers, guy that cut his grass that he met at a Cubs game once maybe said something. Facts are important. Be good. Absolutely. Thank Don't you. be you dickheads. Too. Walk the higher line. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com. Said I got me some